I will say welcome, everybody. It's so good to be here with you uh, today. My name is Sarah Charters, and I'm the president of the United Church of Canada Foundation. Um, and as you came in, you would have received notice that we're, we are recording this webinar, and we do that so that folks uh, who couldn't be with us today are able to hear um, the wonderful things we're going to talk about. And anybody who wants to go back and listen again uh, also has that opportunity. Um, I come to you from the east end of Toronto um, in an area that's covered by the Williams Treaty of 1923. Uh, and I think it's really important to acknowledge that um, that treaty had certain rights and responsibilities on all sides. And we need to live into those uh, responsibilities and relationships um, in ways that we haven't always done in the past. And so um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here for the Indigenous peoples who have been here and, and been stewards and caretakers of the land and continue in that role and hope to be able to join in a good way uh, in that work and relationship. Um, so again, just welcome. And uh, I know we're all very familiar with uh, Zoom at this point, but just a, a note to make sure that you are uh, muted so that we can hear our uh, panelists uh, well. And uh, if you do have questions, please do type them in the chat. We'll be monitoring that and, and uh, passing those on so that we have some, some time for that at the end. Um, I'm going to start by introducing Catherine Glover. Uh, we are so pleased and excited to have, have you here with us today, Catherine. She's a member of the Foundation's Board, a member of the General Counsel Executive, um, plays a huge role uh, at Asylum United in, in London, Ontario, um, and just brings years of dedicated leadership um, in the church, the healthcare sector, and, and the wider community. And um, I'm going to turn it over to you, Catherine, to uh, introduce our panelists and, and carry on. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah. And I'm delighted to be here and uh, moderate this panel. And uh, also very interested to hear from our two panelists this morning. First, we have, uh, and both of them will be featuring their very interesting projects. And the first is Dan Clark. And Dan is here representing Grace United Church in Brampton, Ontario. And he's going to discuss the Connecting Downtown Seniors at Grace. And uh, Anne Pietro Paolo is here representing Humber Valley United Church in Toronto to discuss their Seniors Fitness and Wellness Project. So the way we'll, we'll run this panel, we'll ask Dan and Anne in turn to tell us about their exciting projects. And Dan and Anne, you'll have three minutes each to, to highlight your exciting work. And then we will go into uh, what I understand is usually a very dynamic part of our time together, which will be the questions. And I invite everyone on the call to put your questions in the meeting chat. And if you struggle with that, if, if that doesn't work for you, um, certainly Ashley and I will do my best to watch for any questions that come up as we go along. So with that said, I'm delighted to turn our time over to Dan Clark and look forward to hearing about the exciting work you're doing at Grace United. Thank you, Dan, in advance. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, at Grace, we wanted to provide a meeting place for seniors in downtown Brampton where they could connect with other seniors and with support organizations. First, we hired a person to develop a program, which became our Welcoming Wednesday program. Then we hired a facilitator to organize the activities, schedule speakers, and to provide for supplies for the activities. At the beginning, it was during COVID, so at the beginning, some of the seniors were reluctant to join in person. So we had many of the events and activities online. Welcoming Wednesday was well attended and even our terrible Ontario weather did not stop seniors from attending. That's enough. <laughs> was there anything else you wanted to add? You have time that was very efficient. <laughs> oh, 
Well, you wanted 25 words or less, so I gave you the 25 words or less. Yeah. Well, you have three minutes to tell us more if you'd like to. Uh, you but, had other questions. Will we be answering them? Yes. Um, okay. We, I'll wait for those ones, okay? Okay, that's fine. All right. Well, that's wonderful. So we'll turn it over to Anne now and Pietra Paolo, representing the Humber Valley United Church, to talk about the Seniors Fitness and Wellness Project. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here to share with you a little bit about our process and the program that has developed over the last three and a half years. And really it goes back a long way at Humber Valley United, um, Humber Valley United Church had many programs and many seniors took part in these programs, but they realized that uh, formalizing the programs as part of the strategic plan for the church was very important. So um, I came into the role uh, three and a half years ago when they decided to hire a seniors program coordinator to make sure that that pillar of the strategic plan came to fruition. And I began to work here just a month or two before the pandemic. And we had a number of programs that we wanted to continue and explore. And what the pandemic did was it really opened the door to find new ways to reach seniors in the community. So we're located in Etobicoke uh, as part of Toronto, West End Toronto, and we have one of the highest populations of seniors and very few community centers and services in the area. So we felt there was a space for our church to come in and provide programs for both the congregation that was aging and for the community. And we were able to launch a number of Zoom programs through the pandemic. And we started with fitness and yoga and seated dance. And then we just kept exploring new programs. Um, and we've continued and we now offer at least 15 programs in a variety of areas, um, health and wellness. We have arts and culture, social and lifelong learning and faith and spirituality. And that's where we are today. We uh, release a program every three months and many of our programs reach people in the community as well as in our church. And another piece that is very critical to our program is what we call community care. And that is what we prepare a variety of outreach materials that go to seniors in the community. And we do that by partnering with other local community organizations. So together along with those organizations, we prepare a variety of kits that go out to seniors in the community. Uh, most recently, we did some herbs and vegetable plants for container gardening on balconies. Wow, another exciting project. Thank you both. So um, a couple of questions spring to mind for me. Um, and maybe I'll just I'll just kick it off and and invite folks who are watching to start putting your questions in the chat and we'll be delighted to get to them. One of the common things I hear you both talking about, and I'm interested in this, uh, because all good work takes time and good people. And it strikes me that you both have, um, Dan, in your case, you have a facilitator and in Anne's, you have a seniors program coordinator wonder if you could share with the participants how, how those roles came about, how you funded them, and also how many volunteers are involved. And maybe I'll start with it, Dan for that one. The facilitator came about because one of the first things we did was hire somebody to develop the program. And that person, uh, in the plan they developed said that we should hire somebody to actually organize the activities. Mm -hmm. so, that, so we used a grant from the United Church Foundation, the Seeds of Hope grant, to first hire somebody and then to develop the program. And then we hired uh, a facilitator to run a pilot project. So we this was all 
in the middle of COVID. The facilitator has uh, is still with us and uh, is starting to uh, expand the program. We ended up calling the program Welcoming Wednesday because it was on a Wednesday. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to welcome the community. The facilitator uh, is starting to start a uh, th themed Thursdays. They like WWs, TTs. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not sure what that's going to look like because that's just kicking off. So we are expanding the program, and that's this year we were using funding from a couple of sources. We have some federal money, and we have some City of Brampton money. Mm -hmm. The facilitator uh, has found a lot of speakers that we've used, that we've come in and done uh, speak, uh, talks on safety, on exercising, and we were able to do some of those online as well for people who did want to come out. That's great. So it sounds like the Seeds of Hope grant from the foundation helped you you kick off. It, your... it, was, it, it was critical. We, we yeah. wouldn't have been able to do it without the Seeds of Hope grant. That's good to hear. <laughs> and how about you, um, Anne? Uh, definitely, um, the Seeds of Hope grant was the foundation for this program. So we had an initial Seeds of Hope grant that did allow myself to come into the role. And I was developing the program in coordination with a group of senior volunteers here at the church. That is our seniors advisory committee. And that Seeds of Hope grant um, allowed for me to be here and do that work along with the seniors here. And then over the last three years, we were able to receive more grants, which allowed us to continue. And we built upon that. And now we are part of the new ministries funding. So we are in just entered our second year of a new ministries grant. We also receive money from the federal government for the New Horizons for Seniors program. And we have a large group of volunteers who have been involved at Humber Valley in one way or the other for many years. And we also have some new volunteers along with our partners. So that's how we're able to continue to grow. That's, that's great. What I hear you both saying is of course, what we hope will happen. In the, in the foundation, that the Seeds of Hope grant will, will get this good work started. And then, um, you, you know, uh, churches can then begin to look around for, for other funding. So that's, that's wonderful to hear. So I now see that there are some uh, questions coming in in the chat. And um, I will start going through those. And Salome, it, um, asks, do any of your programs deal with homeless seniors? Can either of you answer that, Anne or Dan? Um, if I may, our program is able to support seniors who may be experiencing housing issues through our partnerships, where our particular church is located um, in Etobicoke. We don't, in our immediate vicinity see a lot of homelessness, but we know that in Etobicoke, there is a great deal of issue facing seniors and housing. So that's how our interaction with our partners, our community partners, help us to reach those seniors. So we deal with a local food bank and also an organization called Maybell Arts. And both of those community partners um, work with seniors as well who are experiencing homelessness or housing issues. And that, that's so exciting. And what I hear there is we're not in this alone. And absolutely. And when mm -hmm. we work with partners, we're stronger, aren't we? That's wonderful. Right. Dan, did you want to, to respond to that? Uh, Grace United is also home to Grace Place, which is a community hub in downtown Brampton. Uh -huh. And we have a an organization called Regeneration Outreach, and they provide a breakfast 365 days a year to the homeless and marginalized in downtown Brampton. And we are right in the center of a homeless 
uh, crisis in downtown Brampton. We have a lot of ravines where the homeless are sleeping, but they can come to breakfast uh, 365 days a year. And because they're there, all the agencies can come in and help them. They can have ID, uh, help them with ID. They provide them with health care. Uh, they provide with whatever they can. They'll even try to find uh, places for them to live. We have some of those seniors, some of those people who are homeless, who are marginalized, are seniors. There's there's quite a few of them in downtown Brampton. And we had done a need study when, for Grace Place to identify what was needed in the community. And yes, the homeless was an, uh, top of the list, but mm -hmm. also and very near the top was that the seniors were underserviced in the downtown area. So we wanted to expand what we were doing with the homeless, we wanted to say, well, let's look at the seniors as well. So that's why we started the seniors program. Well, you know, it's, I think we're seeing this across the country, aren't we? Um, people who are, are really struggling, uh, living, living in tent cities, and they're just so vulnerable. And there's such a huge role for us as churches to, to reach those people and partner with others to do so. So that's great. Um, uh, there was a question from Barb to everyone. How do you fund your projects? I think both of our panelists have spoken a fair bit to this. Um, there was also an answer from uh, Salome again saying donations from local people, municipal, provincial, federal grants. Most of the money comes from private donations. I wonder if you could tell us a little more about that, Salome. I think that's your um, comment. Yep. Hi. Um, we run uh, several programs to get donations. We have the uh, coldest night of the year walk, where people walk all over Victoria, and they get donations for for um, every person who signs up. And we also have a big uh, thing at the end of the year that. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a gala dinner and auction uh, online, but we also get tremendous donations from people who just come in and give us $25 at a time. So we have some people who will give us thousands of dollars and we get a lot of legacy donations as well. Thank you for sharing that. And now there's another question. Is the facilitator position full-time. So Anne and Dan in both of your churches, is it a full-time position? In our case, it's a part-time position. And that is using both our funding from the United Church and the federal government. So that turns out to be about 20 hours a week. Okay. And our, our facilitator is also part-time. Uh, he's doing a few other jobs, but it would be about uh, 15 to 20 hours a week as well. Okay, so significant, uh, a significant amount of time every week to keep programs like this uh, uh, underway. Um, do this, do your speakers come and speak for free? Anne or Dan, or maybe Dan, you, you spoke mostly about the speakers. The, the speakers are generally free. Uh, we have given honorariums to some of them, but we try to keep the costs down by using free speakers. Uh, okay, great. So here's, a, here's a, a great question from John, who's asking about seniors in the 2S LGBTQIA plus community face unique challenges. And that is indeed true. Do either of the programs being discussed have any experience with supporting these communities or know of programs that are doing so? Ann or Dan? Or no, not, any others on the call? We're, we're not doing anything specifically. And I'm not sure in Brampton whether they're, they're doing very much as well. Mm -hmm. How about you, Ann? Um, we have not run any specific programs for that um, population, but we do have participants in our programs who um, are from the LGBTQ plus uh, 
community. And so they have participated in our programs and we do hope to be able to develop in that area. Mm. Thank you. The And then there's a, a comment, the Longhouse Ministry in each East Vancouver offers free parking for seniors living in their cars or caravans. So again, the, the unhoused um, folks living really on the margins and struggling. So, so Barry, if you're, if you're with us still, is this so the seniors can uh, park there and live there for periods of time? Yes, that's true. One of them actually, uh, well, two of them have actually become somewhat regular volunteers with and at the Longhouse Church. We're a very small church in the east end of Vancouver. It's uh, much the size, similar size to a country church, but we feel it incumbent on us to uh, maximize our um, our hospitality. I mean, there's, there's as you any of you know, trying to make your facilities available, it's uh, it's a mixed blessing in many ways. The albatross are trying to uh, run a building and and have other programs going on, including out of school care programs and and groups that rely upon um, a certain degree of privacy or confidentiality because they're struggling with recovery from addictions, etc. Sometimes they clash with um, people who are um, homeless, um, even those in their care cars or caravans, but they tend to be somewhat the, 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 at least having a place for a degree of privacy um lends a bit of stability to um to uh, root people who are not adequately housed um mm -hmm. but seniors as in the, many of us are seniors of course on this uh, very website uh, webinar um have wisdom to distill and share if we can and sometimes we need to be coached um coached and coaxed you know what i mean um yeah. so that um, we're not afraid to kind of name what it is where we think we may in all humility of uh have, have, have wisdom to pass on but at the same time still struggling with all sorts of issues including the angst angst of uh of facing uh of, of admitting our mortality and facing facing our death yeah Thank, thank you for that, Barry. Uh, more questions coming in. Obviously, someone who's on a ministry and personnel committee who's asking, are the positions over, because they're 20 hours, do you pay uh, benefits and pension? So someone who's paying we, attention to budgets. So Dan and Anne, can you answer that? We do, yes. You pay those. Okay, Anne? In our case, no. It's okay. a con it's, uh, private contract kind of position. Okay, so there's different ways to approach it. Okay, um, just carrying on in the chat here, uh, uh, Salome is telling us our place society are very active in supporting LGBTQ population, take part in pride events and are active in welcoming all. It's good to hear. Um, can Seeds of Hope go to intergenerational programming? And this person, it's Pauline, who is thinking about community kitchens. Uh, maybe, Sarah, can you, and maybe you did answer that in the chat. I was typing, but but we got here, so it's faster to uh, to just, to just say, um, Seeds of Hope supports a variety of programs and projects, intergenerational for sure. There are uh, some funds that are more focused on uh, environmental projects or programs or uh, children, ministries, youth at risk. Um, so I would really encourage folks to check out our website, um, which I'm hoping one of my colleagues will just put it in the chat for us uh, so I don't have to type and talk. Um, and um, just take a look at the variety. I mean. We received over 100 applications for our last round and granted a significant number of those for, for many, many um, different projects. So um, if you're thinking about applying, looking for funding for, for the work you're doing, please do give us a call. Eric and Jenna are our staff who are most focused on grants and they would be very happy to speak with anybody about, about their ideas. Yes, and um, I can say, being a board member, we, um, the staff at the foundation are just tremendous about helping you write a grant. And uh, what we really want to do is is start kickstart this really great work. So thanks, Sarah. Um, 
I saw in the chat here, someone is a grant writer. And one of the things that um, I know, um, and Eric and the staff are really good at helping people with this, helping people who are novice writers write grants. So um, uh, I think the question though from, let me just go here from Anne is, um, how do we promote the program as a foundation, I think, within the community to increase participant numbers? Is, is that right? Is that the question, Anne? I hope I'm understanding you properly. And if, if, if I am understanding you properly, Sarah, you would be best placed to answer how we promote the grant programs. Yeah. Um, so, so hoping that this is the, <laughs> the question that's being asked. Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, through, we promote them in a variety of ways. Uh, sometimes we've put ads in Broadview about it. Uh, often we um, include information in our newsletters, in United Church newsletters. Uh, but Anne is asking about the individual churches, how the how Humber Valley and Grace are promoting their oh, programs okay. within the community. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> so, okay, Anne and Dan, how do you promote your programs? Um, so we, we promote our programs in a number of ways. We publish a, a hard copy guide, program guide, like this, um, and we make copies available in a number of locations. And word of mouth is a great way that um, got us started. We also have a weekly e-blast, and we post things on our website. We've connected with the local newspaper and we are in the process of getting um, social media going. So lots of places all the time. It's a great <laughs> strategy. <laughs> Dan? We are just finishing off the first year of a pilot project so we're just not as organized as, as this. Uh, we've relied mostly on word of mouth. Uh, we do have Facebook postings uh, we do go out into seniors events within Brampton and have flyers which talk about the programming that's available, uh, but we've found that word of mouth has worked best and we've had quite a few people from the community who are not members of the church. They're, they come to these programs and, and they come to them and it was mostly word of mouth that they came. They're, the, most of the seniors are not really that digital and they don't have access to everything the younger generations do or don't want it. So word of mouth is what they're relying upon. So I would say that's how we got most of our advertising, most of our participants. Thank you, Dan. Now I inadvertently skipped over Kathy Douglas's question. Uh, do your groups do, so this is to Ann and Dan, uh, do or take political actions for senior justice issues? And if you do, have you had success? Uh, we don't have that as a priority, but we do have speakers who do talk about elder abuse and they talk to our seniors who individually may take political action, but as a organization, we're not doing that. Okay. And Anne? Uh, likewise, we do try to have speakers and issues um, covered in our program, mainly through discussion groups. Um, <laughs> and so on. We haven't taken particular political action, but we do in our weekly newsletter that we publish, we share opportunities for other uh, uh, community connections. So if there are meetings that are going on in the neighborhood, et cetera, we promote those in our newsletter. Hmm. Thank you. Um, there's a note in the chat from Salome, uh, that she goes out on the street to invite people personally. So that human touch is so important, isn't it? And that kind of fits with the next question. Are most of your participants already members of the congregation or are they like the folks Salome's touching with her personalized outreach? So Anne and Dan, are the people that you're reaching primarily in your own congregations? At this point, I would say the uh, over 50% are from the congregation, but we do have a lot that aren't from the congregation. 
we've had some of them who've come to the welcoming Wednesday and decided that they wanted to come to worship on Sunday, but that's that's not the expectation, and we welcome them, of course. Mm -hmm. Very yeah. similar, very similar in our case. We have about 50% the congregational members and about 50% are in the community. And word of mouth, as Dan mentioned, has been a great way of bringing in people from the community. Also some of our in-person programs, such as our walking groups, we now go weekly to the local mall. And that's been a way of us connecting in person with people, many seniors in this particular mall. And so now they started to be part of our walking group. And we have a monthly lunch that is well attended by the community as well. So again, you're talking about that, that personal touch at the mall. We have a mall like that in London too. <laughs> Maybe yeah, every city right. does. Maybe yes. every city does. Um, in terms of political action, uh, uh, an interesting comment uh, from Barry Morris again, that uh, we encourage supporting the current guaranteed liver livable income campaign, which is heating up. And, and that, that's an excellent point, certainly influencing our local political candidates, um, our local politicians to support that is a great kind of political action. Now, Nancy Painter is intrigued by the amount of donations our place receives from individuals. Do you specifically promote this within the congregation or have other methods of spreading the word? So that's to our place. Um, I could answer that. Uh, we don't have a congregation. We're not a church. We're a faith-based organization. But uh, we we are just associated with all sorts of faiths in in the city. Mm -hmm. Okay, and Sarah's just put up a link to the um, uh, Social Action Act Now Guaranteed Livable Income Program. That's great. Thank you for that, Sarah. Sarah and uh, Ashley, have I missed questions? Oh. Um, Oh, what is your attendance at your programs is a question from Ian. So that would be to Dan and Ann. Uh, again, ours was a pilot program. So we started small and we're just growing. We have about uh, 20 to 25 people who come every Wednesday. And we'll see what Thursday brings when we bring in the, the themed Thursdays. Mm -hmm. And our programs have been going for a few years now, and we have a range of programs, some on Zoom and some in person. In total, we have over a thousand different participations every month. So some people come to a number of programs, but um, programs such as our fitness have about 30 people per class. Some groups oh. that are smaller might have five or six people. Um, so each program is a little bit different, but in total over the whole month, we have over a thousand different um, participations. That's great. I just have to uh, uh, mention uh, across the country, pickleball is taking over. <laughs> and I just, I, I'm imagining that some of us have pickleball happening in our church gymnasiums. It's it's the most popular, most popular senior sport sport in North America, so I'm told. So just as an aside. Uh, so uh, Joyce Wicks in, from Sundry, I hope I'm saying that probably Sundry United in Alberta, have an NHSP grant. I don't know what that is, but it's um, for a program called Seniors Socialize covers a catered meal, community resource speaker, and then approximately 40 minutes volunteer musical. And uh, they advertise in a newsletter, word of mouth. It's been very successful, offered twice monthly. And the, don the attendees give a small donation to help sustain and members of the church. So approximately 60 people at every every event. So back to Dan and Anne, just want to ask you 
uh, because there are lots of grant programs around, what caused you to apply to the Seeds of Hope grant program particularly? I think for, uh, for us, it was the fact that you focused on seniors, so we could click that box. But it was also the size of the grant that uh, if we wanted to run a pilot, we knew we had to develop it, and then we knew we had to, to run it, so we needed to hire people to do it. Mm -hmm. And the size of the grant allowed us to do that. So it was it was basically you were targeting seniors. We wanted to do something for seniors and your amount of grant matched what we wanted to do. Thank you. Anne? Um, well, likewise, I think the amount of the grant did allow us to invest in a position that would help us to grow. And I just uh, think it was a very good fit for the church and it was very open to the direction that the church felt they wanted to go in. So it felt like there was so much opportunity and a lot of support. Um, it was a good way to get something started. And then there was further opportunity along the way, once you got it started, to go into the growth grant. So it felt like a really good um, stepping stones. Mm -hmm to grow and there was a lot of support along the way and also um, a lot of opportunity to connect with other churches and to have that sense of support um, from the foundation and connection to other churches. So we've found attending some of the sessions very helpful and the theory of change and all the support that comes through the foundation and the United Church have been amazing. Well, that, that's really great to hear. So it, it allows you to get started and it allows you to really get tips along the way to develop and grow your program. And there's, there's possibilities for future funding. So that, that's really good to hear. And as you were doing that, what was the biggest lesson that you learned, Dan? or Anne, and Anne, or, and maybe there were several lessons. Well, I think one of the lessons we've learned is that uh, in order to apply for these grants, we need a team of people. You can't rely on one person. And so we have a team of people who are looking out for grants, we help write grants, and then we need them to actually do the reporting when the grants are done. So we report back to the foundations or whoever's giving us the money. So teamwork. You approached it as a team. Yes. That's very interesting. That's that's excellent. A team of volunteers, presumably. They're not getting, well, some are staff, but mostly volunteers, yes. Okay. And Anne, what, what, was the, what were your lessons? Well, I think um, having a team that would meet together regularly to review how things were going um, and the fact that we, tended to plan in seasons. So we would plan three months at a time and then we would evaluate how we were doing. Because it was during the pandemic, we didn't know from month to month whether it was gonna be possible to meet in person or should we continue on Zoom. So it kept us um, very nimble, I would say, trying to respond as things happened. And that allowed us also to really try things and see if it worked. So we had a very experimental kind of approach and we didn't uh, commit to anything for the long term until we knew it was working. And mm -hmm. it allowed us to change and pivot as they, as we all use that word a lot um, during, during that time. So I think um, planning in short spurts and then evaluating as you go was helpful for us. And also, I think documenting as we went along the way, just even taking pictures allowed us to look back and see different highlights from programs and kept it sort of fresh in a way of communicating. So I feel documenting is also really critical um, so that you can look back and learn. Mm -hmm. So working as a team, documenting, identifying how you measure success, reporting back on it. 
it's kind of like when you renovate a house, they always say you should take a picture of that kitchen before you start tearing it down and building a new one. It's, it's kind of like that. So those are very helpful tips, I think, for all of us. Uh, there are several questions coming in now about seniors' transportation to, um, to get to these programs. Can you talk about access, Dan, and then Anne? Well, we're, we're a downtown church. We're steps to a go station, via station, bus terminal. Uh, we are part of, uh, the building is, is Grace Place, and we are finding some of the seniors groups do like Grace Place because we don't have parking, but we are close to the bus. So a lot of seniors take public transportation to the programming that happens at Grace Place, including the Welcoming Wednesday. Okay, so lots of public transit. How about Anne? Um, transportation is something that we're really having to take a look at now. During the early part of the pandemic, we were almost entirely on Zoom, so that we didn't have to deal with transportation at that point. Since we've started in-person activities, we rely on people having um, public transit available, which we are in a good location for that. Um, people do have wheel trans in our part of the city. So they do sometimes come by wheel trans. We also have some carpooling when we're going somewhere. And occasionally if it's um, requires a, like a day trip, then we hire a bus and people contribute towards the cost of that. We're doing some local trips this summer and we're going to try sharing some Ubers. So we're going to see how that goes. Ah, interesting. Interesting. Um, and some good comments coming in here. Um, um, and I know this from my own grant writing. It's very helpful to have the photos when you apply for grants because increasingly um, that tells the story to the granting agency if you can send them some photos of what you've done and what you hope to do. Sarah and Ashley, have I missed any of these great questions or comments that you've noticed coming in? I don't want to. So there's some really good discussion here. Yeah, um, I'm just, uh, I'm a little bit curious as to um, whether or not the, the work that you're doing starting to influence other programs or ministries that are offering, like are there things that have come out of, out of the work you're doing that are maybe influencing other aspects of the congregation's life? Uh, one of the things that was a bit surprising was the youth involvement. We did hire some summer students last summer and they were very active on Welcoming Wednesday with the seniors. But this, the seniors themselves have started working with the youth in the congregation. And one of the, they've actually worked on two projects that involve quilting. They did a underground railroad quilt and they've just recently done a reconciliation quilt. So that was a, I think it's a byproduct of the Welcoming Wednesday that the youth were working with the seniors. So the intergenerational piece was a pleasant surprise. Mm -hmm. And how did you recruit those young people, Dan? Uh, well, the young people that were doing the quilt were from the congregation. I see. We didn't uh, have to recruit them. They were there. <laughs> <laughs> and how about you, Anne? Um, well, we have had a lot of really positive interactions, I think, between our program, which we call 55 Plus, and other parts of the church community. Um, there's a community choir in the church, and they've come to our seniors' lunch. And members have kind of joined the choir, and hopefully some of the choir will be attending some of our seniors' programs. So that's been a nice relationship that's grown. Um, our summer students as well, our youth, and so working with them has made some good connections with youth programming. We're going to be hosting a youth summit with our seniors, so that's going to be another nice opportunity, sort of an intergenerational connection. And some of our programs, such as our walking meditation group, um, others in the congregation are interested in some of those sort of practices. So. I think we're we're learning from each other. Mm -hmm. And and Dan and Ann, just to 
be clear, when you say summer students, are those funded through the Canada Summer Jobs? Yes. Program? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Which is another great opportunity, grant opportunity for folks to be aware of. One of the things we're interested in at the foundation is what the biggest lesson you learned from this was from this experience of applying for the grant and then starting your programs. What was the biggest lesson you learned? Dan and then Anne. Uh, I, I think the biggest lesson I learned is that to run any of these programs, you really need staff. You really need the money to pay for staff. Mm -hmm. uh, supplies for seniors, they like to sit down, they like to talk, they like to eat, they like to play cards. They're not hard to entertain. Just They just want to connect, come together, and uh, be with other seniors or with younger people if that's possible. But we need the staff, we need the resources to hire people to do that. Mm -hmm. Staff resources, yeah. To organize the volunteers. We have had volunteers. That's a, another surprise. We've had a lot of the people volunteer and, and do pieces, but you need the key person. You need the, the staff person to motivate it all. Yeah. Just before we jump to Anne, I'll just answer Lynn's question. The summer funding is called Canada Summer Jobs. You can find it on the federal websites and you generally, the applications are generally due in the January of the year you're looking. So Anne, your, the, what was your biggest lesson from this experience? I think, um, as I mentioned before, to plan in manageable chunks. So um, to have a bold vision and to be able to try things but not to, um, but to do it in manageable chunks. So to experiment and try things, but to, to manage it in small steps. Mm -hmm. Good advice. Good advice for life too, <laughs> not just a project. Um, there is a question, uh, Sarah, you may know this. I. I, I sort of know the answer, but it's from Wendy. Are the uh, regions providing any funding for focused on seniors? And there was another question earlier. Do the regions have any staff positions focused on seniors? So Sarah, you might be answered, able to answer about granting opportunities from the regions. Yeah, um, I, I'll do my best. It uh, depends on the region uh, and and how they've organized. And as far as I know, and I could be I could be wrong. I don't believe there's a region that has a staff person that focuses only on seniors, but it may be a, a piece of somebody's work, like under the social justice animators and the like. So, it's worth checking with your region to see if um, if they have staff support and if they have uh, particular funding. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, a note from Bill Cantillon from St. Paul's United Church in Sydney, BC, on Vancouver Island. They operate a support group for seniors in the 2S LGBTQ1A plus community. And that one is financed by a grant from the United Church of Canada. So that's good to hear. Thanks for sharing that, Bill. So we have um, a bit of time left. Are there any other questions that we haven't gotten to? Or Sarah, is there anything else you wish to touch on during this call? I could just at this point add my thanks for everybody uh, who joined us today, participated in the conversation, to Anne and Dan for your uh, all your work and, and sharing that so, um, so well. And Catherine, my thanks to you for doing a fabulous job as moderator. Um, so thank it's you. Pleasure. It's a pleasure. I just, uh, more exciting news from Cedar Park United in Beaconsfield. They run a support for youth, but now they have a strong program for LGBTQ plus seniors. That's great to hear. And funding is from multiple sources, including, including the United Church. That's great. Really good news. Um, the BC idea of a seniors ministry for Pacific Mountain region was spoken about at our general meeting in June, and the region is looking into it. 
and um, I know that many, many people do retire to Victoria. So I'm sure that is a, a very pertinent discussion for BC. So seeing lots of thanks coming in. Uh, uh, we have um, someone who's put some links in the chat about how to, where to look for United Church Foundation grants. Um, also to look for United Church of Canada mission and service grants and lots of thanks coming in. So I think we're reaching the end of our time, Sarah. Um, thank you to everyone for taking the time to join our webinar today. Thank you to the panelists, Anne and Dan. I personally found your stories inspirational and it's just wonderful to hear about the, the amount of work that's been achieved and what a grant from the United Church of Canada Foundation can do to start kickstart really good work. So wonderful. We really appreciate you sharing your time and experience with us. And we look forward to connecting with everyone on uh, future seminars and webinars of this kind. So thank you so much. So very useful. And take care, everyone. Thank you. Good to be with you. And bye for now. <laughs>